Glenn is a 48-year-old contractor who has periodically had issues with mild dandruff off and on for much of his adult life. Lately, Glenn's noticed that the dandruff has gotten worse, and he's scratching his scalp more and more. He's also noticed itchy dry skin on his forehead now and behind his ears. He's feeling more self-conscious about his appearance and wants to know what he can do to improve his condition. Seborrheic dermatitis is a fairly common rash, an inflammation of the skin that causes redness, scaling, or flaking, and itching. It mostly affects skin on the scalp, as dandruff, face, chest, and joints. It's not clear what causes seborrheic dermatitis, but it's thought that overgrowth of Malaysia yeasts contributes to developing the condition. Several other factors have been associated with seborrheic dermatitis, including age, sex, weight, skin color, stress, blood pressure, climate, alcohol, and tobacco use, but the evidence for some of these associations has often been inconclusive. Treatments, including topical drugs that are applied to affected areas of skin, for example, creams, lotions, or shampoos, have the most benefit. We've asked Dr. Hermenio Lima, a clinical immunologist and dermatologist, to talk about seborrheic dermatitis. Dr. Lima is an associate clinical professor in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University. Uh, why don't we start off with just some basics? Uh, what, what exactly is meant by the term seborrheic dermatitis? Uh, thank you for the invitation, Anthony, and I'm glad that we are going to be talking a very common disease, a skin disease today. Um, seborrheic dermatitis is a very common disease, a frequency very high in the population, which is characterized by the production of lipids in a specific area of the body, which results in inflammation of the skin. The most characteristic area is the scalp and sometimes of course uh, in the face as well, especially in the fold areas. Basically the nasolabial fold is the most common area of the body. And also it can occur in areas, other flexural areas. It can expand to the chest, um, areas like a, uh, axilla area and pubic area as well. Every area so that we call seborrheic dermatitis. When you're talking about the nasolabial fold, you're really talking about this this area here where there might be some creases in the skin. And, and when you say uh, lipid production, can you explain a little bit more about what, what that, what's actually happening in, in the scalp and the skin there? Um, so it's a very interesting component, right? In these areas, we have uh, more lipids. It's producing in high quantity in this nasolabial area here and also in the scalp. And in situations where we have a uh, high level of activity of these glands, which can occur by constitutional components like genetic, or even in a stressful situation or association with other diseases, we start to produce too much lipids. In that moment, we have our own flora in our body that is gonna uh, increase in population, in especially the malassezia purfu, or pityriasis uh, purfu. And in this case, they produce free fatty acid, so they eat part of this fat that we produce and the free fatty acid goes back to the cells and disrupts the structure of the cells of the uh, glands and that causes inflammation. And that's why we have uh, the symptoms of itchy, scaly, and the cells when they start to die, they proliferate faster and they start to flaky. So that's one of the main characteristics of the disease, redness and flaky. So just if I understand it correctly, then the, the sebum is a kind of fat or lipid, and that's the seborrhea. There's too much of it being produced. And then sometimes in the scalp and in some of these areas where the skin is close together or creased, uh, it sounds like our own uh, bacteria that's on the skin, which is normal. There's, there's an interaction with the, the fats there or the seborrhea or the, the lipids and our skin bacteria. Um, that then creates inflammation that causes the itching and the scaling. Exactly. And uh, the most interesting kind of component in this kind of uh, process is the fact that uh, all the treatments that we are going to be um, using tend to reduce the production of the lipids. That's basically the component. 
So, and when we think about seborrheic dermatitis, probably some of the listeners may have opportunity to hear the word about dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is a phenomenon that when our flora is not regulated and can be associated even with other diseases. And uh, as a result, we have more lipids, we have more of this uh, microflora growing and these microflora uh, produces excess like waste. So we have too much um, of the lipids this waste is the free fatty acid and the free fatty acid is what causes the inflammation of the seborrheic dermatitis. It's a very interesting phenomenon. So this, this term uh, seborrheic dermatitis, uh, it sounds like there might be other uh, terms that people hear. What, what are some of the other terms that uh, people might be familiar with uh, when they think of, of seborrheic dermatitis? Uh, Seborrheic dermatitis is kind of a general term that we use um, in many times in the popular culture, uh, we use other names. The most common one is to use the term dandruff. Uh, the dandruff is more like when we have uh, like just the fur kind of scaly um, in the scalp, that's the most common one. And um, one other association with the term cradle cap that's usually associated with young, um, like especially babies, when they produce a lot of lipids, they still produce a lot of lipids. Again, the association with the microflora creating the um, uh, seborrheic dermatitis is auto-limited, it disappear over time. Severe forms of the disease, sometimes it can be so intense that receive almost association with psoriasis, so we call it sebo psoriasis, that's another kind of term that we use um, a lot. The difference in this case is more like uh, the location and intensity. But is it is it uh, it is a different condition from most types of psoriasis? But is it that in some cases where it might be really severe with a lot of inflammation that it it would uh, look like psoriasis, or is it that the the inflammation is so severe that it effectively is a, a form of psoriasis at that point? That's a, a very good question, Anthony, <laughs> is kind of a, we don't know exactly the moment that we are gonna move from um, psoriasis to, um, or seborrheic dermatitis to psoriasis. So we have seen cases of evolution of this. So that's why we do not transition. But the most, compo most important component is that the seborrheic dermatitis is always localized where we have hair and psoriasis, especially when it goes in the scalp, the lesions go beyond the hairline. So if by any chance anyone has a lesion that suspected to be uh, seborrheic uh, uh, dermatitis or psoriasis, the difference is very simple is that if the lesion goes beyond the hairline in the frontal area, or even in the posterior area, the nuchal area, it goes beyond, or many times behind the ear, this is not the seborrheic dermatitis, this okay. is psoriasis. So that's the main difference that we have. And it sounds like the um, dandruff would definitely be the most common form that most people would see. And then I guess it could run a spectrum from very mild uh, dandruff uh, to quite quite severe. How how common are is seborrheic dermatitis in the in the face or some of the other uh, areas of the body like skin creases that you mentioned? It's uh, it it's again going back to the component of location and frequency. The most common place is going to be the scalp with the dandruff. Eventually, it evolves to the face, which is like. Uh, in many cases that when the patient look for a treatment from the doctor because it affects the well-being of the patient, the appearance of the patient is difficult to control. This could be also presentations that can be temporary. So you have done roof, but eventually under a stressful situation or other problems, it can appear in the face. And after this is solved, it's kind of regress, but you still have the dandruff. And eventually this phenomenon can expand to different areas of the body where they tend to be more constant in these cases. So like maintain the face, go to the chest, especially in women between the breast, um, but men can have also in this area. 
pubic area is a very common area as well. And sometimes under the arm, you can have these kind of components as well. We, we've talked a little bit about sort of the, the extra production of, of sebum or lipids that's involved. Can we say a little bit more and can you say a little bit more about what causes seborrheic dermatitis? I'm interested too, you, you mentioned that sometimes stress may uh, make it worse or bring it out. What, what do we know about what causes uh, seborrheic dermatitis? So it's a very interesting component, despite the fact that it's a very common disease, we still learning about this kind of component, despite the fact that uh, it's very easy to access and to study this uh, disease. We know that there is a genetic association that's one of the most common component, but we have seen also patients that do not have history and I will say then, Anthony, even sometimes personalities of the patients can be associated with this phenomenon. So the, the pathophysiology, internal pathophysiology of the disease is also association with a high production of the adrenal glands, the glands that we have over the kidney. And these glands produce like stress hormones and basically like under a stressful situation, we produce these hormones that induces a lot of seborrhea or basically sebum production in our area. Finally, our microflora they makes the components of, of the, uh, the dermatites uh, as a result of that. So, so when, you, when you talk about the personality, I think of, and probably many of our listeners, the type A personality, somebody who might be high stress, maybe their adrenaline or stress hormone levels are higher. Are, are those some of the scenarios where the, the, those uh, people with that personality type might have higher levels of circulating uh, stress hormones and may also be more vulnerable to seborrheic dermatitis? Is that what exactly. the evidence uh, shows? Exactly. And, and this is a very interesting kind of component. We know that the neurosystem like the nerves also involved in this kind of a disease as well, um, to the point that some diseases, like for instance, like Parkinson, can develop seborrheic dermatitis. The patient could be completely uh, normal and in the development of the disease Parkinson, they can develop more seborrheic dermatitis. It, sometimes it tends to be very intense. Other very interesting situation that ties the immune system and the um, neurosystem is a stroke. So patients that develop a stroke never had seborrheic dermatitis. Eventually they can develop seborrheic dermatitis. So we know that this pathophysiology of this disease involves the immune system, the skin of course, and the neurosystem. That's why we see some associations with the type I A personality as well, that you were saying. So this is kind of a situation like uh, it's very, very common uh, patients with uh, uh, dandruff develop severe seborrheic dermatitis under stressful situations. And I think what you were saying too, I guess the, the components of the, uh, the bacteria or other uh, creatures that live on the skin normally, I guess there's genetic variation in that too. And that might also, uh, as you say, the interplay between the different factors. Is there, is there a relationship with the climate or weather as well? Is, are, are there times of year when this might be more problematic? Uh, that's, uh, thank you for reminding me that, Anthony, yes. Like uh, there are situations that uh, varies from time to time. Um, like we have situations like, for instance, sun exposure, like mild sun exposure reduces inflammation of the skin. So sometimes we have improvement of some of these patients in uh, when we start to have early summer. However, in the opposite direction, when we have very uh, humid summer, where we start to produce a lot of sweaty and activation mm. of these glands, then it can, cause, uh, can make it worse. In the other situation, in the winter time, when our skin dries, we eventually have to produce more lipids. Our body reflects with the production of more lipids, and again, we have worsening in the winter time. So the weather is quite interesting. It's gonna be varying from patient to patient, but sometimes summer is better, 
Sometimes summer is worse. And we have seen years, I will say, um, some years you have a, a bad summer and other years you have a bad winter kind of for manifestation mm. of the disease. It, it sounds like uh, many parts of Canada might have the worst <laughs> case scenario where they have a hot, humid summer, which is also short, and then a, a longer winter period. So maybe yeah, we have you're, a, you're, a climate that... about Southwest Ontario. <laughs> yeah, a climate that predisposes many Canadians to, uh, to seborrheic dermatitis. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about treatment. Can you can you speak about some of the different treatment options and uh, evidence based treatment options for seborrheic dermatitis? And and uh, maybe we'll come back to our our patient Glenn and and what you might recommend for him in this situation. Yeah, that's a very interesting kind of component because as consider a disease that is very common it's not uncommon that the first line of therapy is uh, the over-the-counter therapy. So it's very common to find in any shelf, in any drugstore that you find the dandruff shampoos that the population use. Uh, one of the note of things that maybe uh, our patient is gonna be kind of making a mistake and come eventually to the doctor, to the family doctor, and eventually to the specialist is the use of these uh, uh, over-the-counter kind of medications. So the most common presentation is shampoos, and we are gonna have multiple sources of uh, this. Uh, the most common one is gonna be ketoconazole, like nizoral shampoo, shampoos, or other types of chemicals in, uh, that's gonna control basically the production of lipids and dry the skin in this case, and also re uh, reduction of the population of the uh, malassezia furfur um, and uh, or pterosporum valley. So, um, but it's important for the patients to note that this is an application that has to be done before shower. Um, so we should not replace our regular shampoo with the dandruff shampoo. So we have to apply five, 10 minutes before shower in the scalp, if it is location in the scalp, but also in the face, if it is the case, or any part of the body. And we should be using these shampoos around two to three times a week. That's the basic kind of initial treatment. Eventually, even using these treatments, the patient uh, have difficult to uh, control the disease. Then we are gonna be starting to consider uh, other kind of treatments that um, Unfortunately, there is not much evidence-based medicine for these kind of components. Uh, there is no much studies on it, but there are interesting kind of uh, pathways that we use. One of the most common one, Anthony, is the sometimes we use uh, uh, antibiotic for, um, for acne. And this is like a doxycycline, uh, minocycline or tetracycline. That's a very common kind of pathway. The same that we use for rosacea as well, that also a disease of the skin that has some associate, association with the sebaceous glands. Um, the other component as well, eventually we can use isotretinoin, uh, which is retinoids, the same idea, reduction of the activity of the sebaceous glands so isotretinoin is something that we can use in some cases and the patient respond really well. I have very few cases, severe cases that I already passed these kind of phases where I have to start to think outside of the box, let's call it this way. And I have uh, eventually to use uh, medications that we can use for psoriasis, like for instance, methotrexate, and eventually we can use Otesla, which is a, a premilast, is a new medication that we use for psoriasis that can be used for severe seborrheic dermatitis as well. So uh, to summarize, it sounds like um, many people, especially if they have mild dandruff um, and, and they follow the directions <laughs> of how to use the product properly, they may get relief with some of those over-the-counter uh, dandruff shampoos, as long as they are applying them in the proper way and, and more like a medicine rather than a regular shampoo. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's because of the variability 
of all of the different factors that we talked about, some people might have more factors related to the skin bacteria that's contributing to the inflammation. And I wonder if they're the ones that might do better with, you know, some of the antibiotic treatments, but it sounds like we don't necessarily know what all of the different, you know, causes are for each individual. So you may have to try uh, a series of different uh, treatment options before getting relief. Uh, is that is that fair to say? It's it's very it's completely correct what you're saying. Um, what I describe at the end are rare cases that we have to use, but it's more important as well to highlight to uh, our patient that um, the this is a chronic disease, so we have control. So the use of the dandruff shampoo should be used in a regular base, not just once and after control. And as I mentioned before, even season-wise, you can have difference. Some seasons you're gonna be using more, other seasons you're gonna be using less. I just wanna highlight one point that came uh, to my mind right now um, is that um, many times, the initial appearance of the disease can scare the patient. And uh, maybe the patient should be um, considering this um, as a manifestation of internal organ disease or some kind of thing. Like I said, all the diseases, neurological diseases that you should be concerned, but the majority of the cases, seborrheic dermatitis is not associated with any serious uh, uh, deadly disease or any other problem. So the patient can maintain easily the treatment. In terms of treatment approaches, if uh, is the approach for uh, somebody who has seborrheic dermatitis on the face, is that similar or different? And I, I'm wondering if you could speak, there, there were some recent, uh, uh, some recent evidence to suggest that topical steroids might be helpful in, in some cases as well. Uh, that's a good point as well. Um, we, uh, there are situations that we use the steroids as what we call rescue therapy. So when the patient is having a situation uh, like, let's suppose our patient has to go to give an interview <laughs> and, and doesn't want to appear like having a red face kind of thing. So we can use the steroids in this case uh, to reduce the inflammation really fast. However, it's not a recommendation that we use. Uh, we have uh, a lot of concerns of regular use of the um, steroids in the face because they can actually lead to another disease that's called periorificial dermatitis, uh, which is very interesting um, uh, kind of component. So the use of topical medications, um, it's kind of a very controversial I tend not to use uh, because it goes against the principle that we know that more lipids we do, we pro provide to our own bacteria, more activity of the disease yeah. we have. So that's why the shampoos, they are coming like they are the soap that remove the lipids. So reduce the food for the bacteria, plus it reduces the population of the bacteria. Then we can use the shampoo in the face. So we have also other uh, anti-inflammatory medications as well. Like now we have the um, pimecrolimus and tacrolimus, which are not steroid-based creams. So the commercial names is Elidel and Protopic. But also, again, it's, a, it's kind of, a, you solve the problem of the inflammation, but you give food to the bacteria so for the microflora. So I tend to avoid this kind of combination. I use in special cases just to initiate the treatment to give a, a emotional relief for the patient. And after that, I kind of go with the classical treatments, removing lipids, it's better than adding lipids to, to the treatment. We've, we've talked a little bit about some other conditions and I guess, uh, you know, in general, seborrheic dermatitis for most might be mild and as you say not necessarily associated with any worrisome condition 
But what are some of the other types of dermatitis that uh, adults and older adults might have? And uh, you, you also talked at the beginning about, you know, differentiating based on location, but I guess maybe, maybe just speak a little bit about other types of dermatitis and uh, some of the differences and similarities with seborrheic dermatitis. It's a very interesting question, Anthony, as well. Uh, when I'm teaching my medical students, residents, uh, and others, um, I always say dermatology is a disease of, uh, or a speciality that we have to be like a real estate, is location, location, location. <laughs> so when we're thinking about the seborrheic dermatitis and thinking about the face, um, we have to think about other diseases that can cause red face a uh, scaly kind of component. So the most common of all is another dermatitis. It's called atopic dermatitis. The atopic dermatitis, the location is going to be especially around the eyes, the eyelids as well, but it can occur in the same locations like face, forehead. The difference is going to be like uh, the other parts of the body tend to be involved more the neck and it spread down a kind of component. Psoriasis, uh, we mentioned about the difference being in the scalp, but uh, also there are psoriasis in the face. We call atypical psoriasis as well. And they tend to appear like in eyelids as well, uh, sometimes around the mouth as well. But again, we are gonna have the other parts of the body. We have to look the patient as overall. Uh, another common uh, situation that uh, has been, uh, even I have received patients with seborrheic dermatitis coming with the diagnosis of lupus. We have to remember that lupus, especially in a young population, can appear on the red around the, um, the famous butterfly kind of sign on the nasal bridge. So in this case, it goes different here. It actually doesn't affect the nasal labial kind of uh, folds. Um, we also can have some sort of contact dermatitis, which is the patient use makeup and have allergy to the makeup. And as a result of that, we have uh, a redness. Again, in all these other diseases, we have to see the patient as overall and thinking about asking the patient what are the symptoms, like in the lupus, do you have joint pain? Are you losing hair? And so on and so forth. I guess too, we as as physicians, we often try to have one overarching diagnosis to explain things. But I'm thinking as well, when you have a condition that is as common as mild dandruff, you might also have dandruff and lupus or dandruff and uh, something else. So you, as you say, you have to look at the at the big picture when when doing that. Exactly, and uh, uh, the. We, we have the tendency now uh, to do the medicine really fast and oversimplify uh, things, but it's very, very important to pay attention to the fact that like when the disease gets to be more resistant to the typical treatment, then is the moment that we have to take our position back and then consider a differential diagnosis, what we are not getting the information uh, to make the correct diagnosis for the patient. Do you, do you have any guidelines for people about, you know, what, what might be the point at which they ask uh, for a referral to see a specialist if they're, you know, they've tried maybe over-the-counter solutions and then they've seen their family physician or their primary care practitioner. At, at, at what point would you maybe suggest to somebody that they ask for a, a referral to see a dermatologist? That's an excellent question, uh, Anthony, as well, because it's very difficult to say um, one specific component. I will say time. It's one of the specific components. Like if you use for many uh, weeks and months uh, the same kind of uh, process and it's not working, it's very important. But the decision to look, help, look for help is many times is individual. And it's gonna be depend upon multiple aspects. Like for instance, we can even have a gender based kind of component. Um, and I will say eventually, if it's affect the, the face uh, and many times, even in using the, the treatment, the typical treatment and the patient is unhappy with the, the outcome of the treatment, 
uh, that's the moment that they should look for the family doctor and discuss uh, uh, options. And as um, um, if the family doctor thinks is necessary, then uh, go with the specialist, the dermatologist at this moment. As a as a general question, uh, dermatology is a very uh, visual field. Uh, are are you and and your colleagues are uh, doing more uh, virtual consults than ever during the pandemic? And uh, is that the kind of is this the kind of condition where somebody could see a dermatologist for a virtual consultation or send photos in advance? That's uh, a reality that we have nowadays. We are doing a lot of virtual kind of consultations. Um, and in reality, uh, my general um, practice has been um, in uh, observing like by picture and talking with the patient over the phone. Um, and eventually sometimes in few cases, we have the cameras and getting the idea about the diagnosis and eventually treating the patient. If again, um, I'm not um, really comfortable with the diagnosis, if I feel that this is not the correct diagnosis, I will bring the patient to the clinic for observation uh, and make sure that we have the proper diagnosis as well. But in reality, um, I think a, a well-trained dermatologist is always gonna be uh, pay attention to the history of the patient yeah. and trying to understand when the disease start and what is the frequency of the events. And uh, if there is any other systemic association of the disease and to make a better decision for treatment. Um, I particularly, and I think any dermatologist should not rely only on the picture to make the diagnosis. We need the history. It's, it's still doing the classical uh, medicine, which is uh, basically uh, history and uh, examination. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, Dr. Lima. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate uh, this conversation about cerebral dermatitis and I hope has been very helpful for the listeners.